Bob. Last time, maybe the time before too? No, I don't think so. I don't know. We talked about uh, finding the integral over some region of some number of variables. I'll just write it this way. If you write it that way. So, uh, yes, this includes the next Yes and no. So, <laughs> next week exam, we'll have an integral. At least one, probably one. And so, yes and no. <laughs> if you understood everything we did to this point completely, 100%, and sometimes you're willing to work hard, you can now go to sleep and wake up in two weeks and it'll be okay. But this material is sort of kind of on the exam if you want it to be right. <laughs> is that in this room? Right? Uh, uh, this is the vents. Yeah. Anyway, so we have some function from Rn to R. Uh, no. Yes. And I'm thinking of, so this is sort of a, so dv is the n dimensional volume element. So it's dx1, dx2, up to dxn, and r is some subset of r. Right? So we talked about doing this as an iterated integral. I don't know how many are in there of our function. So usually, there's two or three of these things, or maybe one, but you know. And so this is so the n dimensional volume. I guess n plus one, right? Yeah, n plus one. So if I have two variables, then I'm talking about three dimensional volume. Reminding you, anybody have a clue what I'm talking about? Right? So, for example, say I have f of xy is x squared plus y squared. So, this takes r2 r and uh, maybe I want the piece uh, of this graph, so I want the volume for x between 1 and 2, y between 0 and 1. So the graph here on this surface looks like it's a paraboloid. And for x between 1 and 2, it's going to give me a chunk here. And y goes from 0 to 1 to this chunk. So I'll have something like that. I don't know. I think that's what I have. Uh, Um, and this we would write as, for example, the integral from 0 to 1. Did I do something wrong? Probably. Yes, x goes from 1 to 2. We'll go all the way down. We'll be floating up in the sky here. Uh, 
even worse. Uh, Now it works. Um, anyway, we have 0 to 1, 1 to 2, so here x goes from 1 to 2, and that gives me a volume and you just do the integral and blah, blah, blah. Right? Nobody needs me to actually do this calculation. I just integrate first the x's, then I get a function in y, then I integrate that function, and there I go. And we talked at some length, which I guess I'll do some more in a minute, uh, of parameterizing the thing where the, the region is not a rectangle. Right here I'm integrating x goes from 1 to 2, y goes from 0 to 1 over this rectangle. And things are easy, but if my boundary has some kind of curved edge, then I have to worry about describing that. So I talked. At some length last time about that. Uh, by the way, how many people watch the videos? Anybody? So last time, um, I set the video up. It was all good to go. Somebody asked me a question. I talked to them, and I went and taught the class. I neglected to push the on button. So there's no video for last time because I forgot to push on. <laughs> this time, it's on. Let me check. Yes, there's still a red dot. It's still on. Okay. So, rather than doing more examples of that, I want to move along a little bit. My notes are completely backwards. No, they aren't. Uh, so one thing that we do in a single variable, say you have the integral of x times the square root of x plus 1 dx from, I don't know, 0 to 1. Sure, that's, let's not do zero. Well, okay, zero to one. Say I have this, then the way we would do this integral is we would make the substitution u equals x plus one. So du is dx, that's a one. Doesn't look like a one, but it is. And here, x is u minus one. And so this integral would become when x is zero, u is one. When x is 1, u is 2. x is u minus 1. x plus 1 is u. du is dx. So we can do this integral now because it's easy. Because this is the integral from 1 to 2 of u to the 3 halves so minus u to the 1 half. du is, or integrated, is 2 thirds u minus u to the 5 halves, 2 fifths, that's a 5. And, uh, 3 halves, 2 thirds, 3 halves from 1 to 2 is some number. 2 fifths times 2 to the 5 halves, 2 thirds, 2 to the 3 halves, 2 fifths. So we can do that, okay, fine. Now, if we have more than one variable, maybe things are a little different. Um, now, in fact, before I go to more than one variable, I'm going to talk about, so I want to change coordinates here. If I have a multiple integral, suppose I had it set up this way, uh, I can do, do the same business. Right here, there's no problem. So here, I could still do the, this part by making the substitution u is x plus 1, blah, blah, blah. I can still do that integral, no problem. But maybe what I want to do instead, so if you recall, so this is the same. A couple of classes ago, um, we talked about functions in polar coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates. And maybe our region is more naturally described 
in one of these other coordinate systems. So for example, so suppose, so suppose that I want to um, integrate over a circle. So suppose I just want to integrate over a circle like this. So I'm going to describe this is, say, the circle of radius 2. And suppose that I have some function. So suppose I want to find <coughs> volume of f of xy is x squared plus y squared over, so with, and again, I'm doing an easy one, but let's say it's this one, um, with x, x and y inside the circle. So I could set this up. So one way I could do this is I could set it up some integral, some integral, x squared plus y squared dx dy. And now finding these boundaries, let me actually set it up this way. It's a little bit tricky. It's not hard. It's a little bit tricky. So we, we're thinking about this circle in radius 2 which is y is, so the circle is x squared plus y squared is 4. And so y will be 4 minus x squared on the top part. And on the bottom part, y will be minus 4, minus square root 4 minus x squared. And I guess I really am setting this up dy dx. So if I take, so my x values are going to range from minus 2 to 2. And as x ranges from minus 2 to 2, a particular, here's a particular x, the y values will go from this curve to that curve from minus square root 4 minus x squared to plus square root 4 minus x squared. Right? This is what we did last time. And so now this is just an integral and you just do it. So we integrate the y's and we get, let me do the, let me do the first step. I'm not going to keep going. Minus 2 to 2. When I integrate the y's, I get y x squared plus y cubed over 3 evaluated from y equals minus 4 minus x squared square root 4 minus x squared. I plug in, I get an integral in x, well, there's a dx somewhere. I plug in, I get an integral in x, blah, 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 I get the answer. Is anybody confused about how to do this? Okay. So I'm assuming everybody can do this. So I'm not going to. But instead of that, I don't want to set it up this way. This function is particularly nice in polar coordinates. This region is particularly nice in polar coordinates. So if I want to think in polar coordinates, I want to set everything up and just do everything natively in polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, my function, x squared so plus y squared, is just r squared. And so my circle, so this is f of xy is r squared. This is some other function. My region, my domain, 
is just r goes from 0 to 2. Also much simpler. Yeah? Why is the function of r of data? OK, so let me say this a little more. And then when they have the third angle in it, the left angle? No, this is plain. Oh, yeah. OK, right? This is polar coordinates, so I'm putting in r and theta, and out comes something. Out comes a number. Right? So my, my, well, my graph sits over this circle. So we describe my input variables in r and theta rather than in x and y, and my output z is x squared plus y squared. So if I put in outcomes, if I put in x and y, outcomes x squared plus y squared. But that's the same as if I tell you r and theta, outcomes r squared. And it doesn't depend on theta because this thing is circularly, it's, it's got a circular symmetry. It's a surface of revolution. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, you can do this problem. You could do this problem already because you could do it using cylindrical shells or whatever stuff you know how to do. But I'm using this as an example to try and illustrate a more general fact. So, you could do this, this directly. Not a problem. But I'm thinking I want to make the substitution that xy goes to r cosine theta, r sine theta. And how do I have to adjust the integral to make that? That's really the question that I'm trying to make. I'm making a substitution, just not x. I'm not just substituting x and substituting y separately. I'm substituting <coughs> variables that depend on both of them. And we need to account for that. Another way to say this is I'm trying to just set everything up in polar coordinates from the start. Because everything is much simpler if I just think of it in polar coordinates in this case. But it is not, so this is not the answer. The integral <coughs> as r goes from 0 to 2 and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi of r squared dr d theta. This is wrong. You might think it is, but it's wrong. Because I didn't account for the dx dy changing to dr d theta. I didn't account for the factor. Well, this is a bad example because du is dx. So, oops. Um, but if du is not dx, I have to account for du, right, when I change variables. Similarly, this is wrong because it doesn't represent the same thing as this integral. So I want to explain what it should be. Is this, is this clear to people why this is wrong? So let's go back to the beginning, well, sort of the beginning, and think about setting up this integral to represent this volume <coughs> natively in terms of r and theta. So what am I doing? I'm constructing little pillars that reach up to the graph, but my pillars, the cross section of the pillars is not a rectangle. In this case, my little, my little area form is a rectangle, and the area of this is dx dy. But in the polar case, my little area thing, the cross section of my, of my <coughs> slice is a sector of angle d theta and with dr. And its area is not dr d theta. Because if it's really close here, these guys have the same, well, I guess, all right, 
these guys, the black guy here, and this guy here, have the same dr d theta, but the area is quite different. We have to account for the fact that the area changes with r. And so the area of this thing Well, dr is still about the same, but this link is not d theta, but r d theta. This link here, this link. is however much theta increased times how far away you are. Right? And so this area is just about uh, r d theta, this is the length this direction, times dr. This is my, my area in polar coordinates. Does this make sense? Anybody confused by this and willing to admit it? I'm seeing some faces that are like, what? So, right, if I let, if I take a little sector like this, a little polar rectangle, then its area is about its width in this. <laughs> it's about its width in this direction. But it's not the angle, it's R D theta. Um, I mean, I can write this more formally. I can chop it up, blah, blah, blah. But I think, is this clear enough to people? So that means that the correct thing in this case, let's write it a little more formally. We're going to integrate over the circle of my function, which is r squared, times dA, <coughs> right? Where a is dx dy, maybe it shouldn't be r squared, how about I just say f? <coughs> or f of xy, I don't care, f of my variables, dA. If I'm doing this in polar, then my change in area will be the integral over the circle. It's actually the disk. So it's, it's the inside of the circle. Of r squared, that's my function. And then dA is r dr d theta. Maybe I should write r d theta dr but it sort of rolls off the tongue easier to say r d r d theta. Because it's like r d r d r r r r r the line and then r d r. People don't know the line, right? That's an old cartoon. The 60s. But anyway, you have to watch it a lot. Um, anyway, so r d r d theta is our area form. How the area, a little slice, of r's and thetas gives us our area. So that means that this integral represented as a double integral in polar would be r cubed dr d theta. And r goes from 0 to 2. And theta goes all the way around, so that'll be 0 to 2 pi. And now this is an easy integral. Um, and since it's easy, I guess I can even do it. So let me do it here. So this guy is r to the fourth over 4, evaluated from 0 to 2, integral 0 to 2 pi. Theta, r to the fourth is 16, 16 over 4 is 4, 0 to 2 pi d theta, which is 8 pi. So the area of this paraboloid in polar coordinates is just is 8 pi. 
If you do this ugly integral here, which will come up with nasty square roots and all sorts of ugly stuff, you should also get a pi. It's sort of surprising that there's some pi sitting in here, but we're probably going to have to do a trig substitution and all sorts of icky stuff. This integral is not fun. Oh, this looks easy, easy, easy. Okay. So I want to also discuss the other two coordinate systems that we discussed. So now let me uh, pom, right? That's pomming, right? Yes. Yeah. So let me come back to Tommy's question. You might encounter an integral like this on the exam, which you can do in principle in x and y. But it's a heck of a lot easier if you do it in polar. You don't have to know about polar to be able to do this, but it will make your life easier. So that's really the answer to your question. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Okay. So I will not ask a question like, do this integral in cylindrical coordinates. But I may ask an integral that's easier to do in cylindrical coordinates. Um, I lost track of where I am. Oh, we can get that same one. Okay, so now let's, um, actually let me do cylindrical coordinates first. So now if we think in terms of cylindrical coordinates, so now I have some function of three variables. Um, and so now I'm going to be calculating, I don't know, some density over a spatial region or average temperature or something that depends on three variables. And my region that I'm integrating over could be just a Q. So this is my area form. going to be dx, dy, dz. So I could integrate this thing by some triple integral like this. Let me just leave it general. But I could also think in spherical coordinates, so let me remind you, which I shouldn't have to remind you too much, because it is on the homework that's due this time, that we can describe something in spherical coordinates, uh, no, I'm doing cylindrical, I'm sorry, where we're doing polar coordinates in the xy plane, and then we go up to some height z. So I describe my, my points by polar coordinates instead of x and y, and z in the height. <clears throat> and it's not very surprising, so if I'm imagining that I'm trying to describe some three-dimensional region in cylindrical coordinates, then a little, uh, instead of a box like this being my natural, tiny little infinitesimal element of volume, I'm going to think of, well, I move my thetas a little bit. That'll give me some sector. I'm trying to draw it in the base. Some sector like this. I guess this is behind, so I should have dotted it. Mm, my perspective's a bit off. Right? My natural block of volume, I'm going to let, and I guess this curves, I'm going to let theta vary. So this width is d theta, and this distance is dr. Yes, it'll be r d theta. And this is dz. But of course, this length depends on how far out I am. So in fact, it's r d theta. So if I let theta here vary the d theta amount, 
then that length is R to the theta. So my volume element is just like before, R dr d theta dz. Which I can also think, in some sense I don't need to even talk about cylindrical coordinates in this case, because I can think of my cylindrical object, so if I wanted to, you know, that the, the, the change of variables for cylindrical is x, y, z, r cosine theta, r sine theta, and z is just left alone. I can think of if I have some integral expressed in cylindrical coordinates, I can think of that as just x and y are expressed in polar and z is just z. So there's nothing sort of new there. Okay? All right. On the other hand, and rather than maybe doing an example, well, actually prove that this change of variables works this way, which I'll do a little more general. I won't do the proof, actually. I'll just state the theorem. Um, okay. So, so, so think about it. We can think of it in two ways. In one way, I can redo the whole theory. So if you remember, let me, let me draw the picture in three dimensions because it's a little hard to draw in two dimensions. So I can, I can draw it in three dimensions. So I'm putting in x, y, z. So I'm integrating over some three-dimensional, this is some three-dimensional blob. And on this three-dimensional blob, if I'm integrating x, y, z, then I calculate, I take little tiny cubes. I assume that the, the function is constant. Okay. And then I let the size of the cube go to zero, so it will be constant. Right? So, so, so that is oh, oh. my integral over my blob. I thought you meant over all the cubes would be constant. No, no, no. Yeah. Over one cube is, is constant. So my integral over the cube of the blob of f of x, y, z, d volume will be the sum over all the little cubes oh, so do I oh, you the little blobs as long as or all the little cubes as long as the cubes will eventually go to zero it still works. Yeah. Okay. So I, I do it over my cubes and I add up uh, the volume of the cube times f of x star, y star, z star where x, y, z are in the cube. So x, so here with, so volume of cube, let's call it sub i. So x, i, y, j, z, k, so i, j, k is in the cube. And then I take the limit as the size of the cubes goes to zero. So that's how I define when we're integrating x, y, z. And so this, if this exists, then this converges to whatever the range is, f of x, y, z, dx, dy, dz. Right? But I could have, instead of using little cubes, I could use some other shape. And the other shape that I could use, so for example, if I want to describe my little cubes, not as cubes, but as uh, little blocks of cheese. Hmm? So any, any shape that can just fill up an object will work. Provided that I can continuously fill up the object 
So you can have a more general definition of an integral. Absolutely. Okay. I yes. So it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just these are common coordinate systems. So if I want some other coordinate system and I can describe them until in terms of, so you know, imagine some MC Escher kind of situation where you've tiled the plane by little dragons, and I want to describe the integral in terms of little dragons. You just have to somehow describe the area of the little dragon depending on where it is. Fine, I get the same thing. Not the same formula, but the same answer. So if I want to integrate over in dragon coordinates, that's fine. Yeah. I'm sure you're getting the volume of like pie slice or whatever. Like with I understand the R plane things are are theta, but how does that tell you the area? Okay. So this is not exactly. Yeah. It's just it's this. So this is this is actually kind of a lie. Okay. If the thing, so I have to imagine this is very skinny, so that R here and R here are very close to the same. So this width dr is tiny. So this width, this R value and this R value are pretty much the same. So this length is R d theta for the outer R, and this length is R d theta for the inner R. But if R, if these two R's, so this is R in and R out, and if R in and R out are very close together, then R in d theta is very close to R out d theta. And since I'm taking the limit as they come to one, it's okay to pretend that they are exactly the same. And similarly, but here, the difference between R in and R out doesn't depend on theta at all. So this distance here is just dr. And the distance between this z and this z doesn't depend on theta or r at all, so it's just dz. And so this, the volume of this little guy has to be corrected by a factor of r. If I'm taking a little guy who is far out, he will be bigger than a little guy who is close out. Now, yeah. So I am I am saying this rather informally. The book is a little more formal, and I'm being a little more informal to try and give you an idea of what's going on. I'm being sort of mathematically sloppy, but I'm being sloppy on purpose because I think it's easier to understand the sloppy. It doesn't mean I don't know how to do it more formally. I just don't want to do it. Oh yeah, they have to tie. So you, so you have to have one of those arbitrary triangles. The dragons have to fit together. That's why I said it's an M.C. Escher picture, right? You know, you have these M.C. Escher pictures with little fish, and all the fish fit together. Yes, you can do lots of them. It doesn't. I mean, you know, anything. I mean, we can we can integrate in terms of. Anything that we can tile the plane with, that we can describe that thing. But of course, usually you're not going to use little dragons. I'll, I'll, I'll say how to do that a little more generally soon. So, so cylindrical coordinates, polar coordinates, they're really the same thing. I've just got some extra dimensions thrown in there. We do get something different if we think in terms of ser spherical coordinates. Or we ask Siri for coordinates. Um, those would be spherical coordinates, I guess. Um, so in spherical coordinates, we measure, we take an angle with the x axis and call that theta. And then that gives us a plane here. And then we take within that plane, some angle V from the vertical, and then along that line we go some distance, and the book calls it R, but I'm going to call it rho. And so we can describe a point 
in space here by theta, which is the angle from really the XC plane. Phi, which is the angle from the vertical. And then rho, which is the distance from the origin. Right? We talked about this a couple of classes ago. People okay with this? Let me uh, imagine I'm standing at the origin, and I want to describe, and, and this is x, now uh, wait a minute, this is x, that's y, and this could be x, this is x, that's y, that's z, okay? And I want to point at that projector. So, so in terms of, of theta, I'm going to turn 45 degrees, and now I'm at that projector. Of course, we'll do pi over 4, but for my theta, is pi over 4. My phi is I put my arm straight up and I go down until I'm pointing at the projector. This angle is about, I don't know, it looks like about 60 degrees. So this is um, uh, three, pi, over three. Pi, over three. pi over three, thank you. So this is about pi over three. And then rho uh, looks like about 12 feet, 18 feet. You want any meters? Okay, it's about five meters. Maybe it's, it's not that long? No, it's four meters. That's Okay. I'm not very good at judging it. It's about 3.6259 meters. Um, anyway, it's that far. So, so phi is this end. And if I turn, I get all of the things that I see in this cone. Right? So this is the angle from the vertical. And this is the angle that you spin around, and rho is how far out you go. And so now, I mean, and this is this is a good coordinate system for things which have some kind of spherical symmetry. Um, my volume element in this, I'm probably not going to be able to draw it, but it's a it's so imagine a big sphere, and I'm going to take a little chunk of it. A little chunk of a sphere in all the dimensions. This is supposed to be the angle. Sorry. That's supposed to be the angle. Right? It's a little piece of a sphere where this angle here, let's go back to the origin, this angle here is d theta. This angle here is d phi. And this distance here is d rho. My phi looks like a zero. So maybe I should draw it again. Right? So I have that little, little thing. And now it's a little more complicated to describe what this is. So let's, let's start with the phi. So if I take a little piece here where phi varies, then this height, well, this one's easy. This is d rho. The thickness of this little piece of the sphere, think of it as a thick sphere, and I cut out a square piece, right? I took a sphere, and I took a little square on it, and then I carved it out. My thick sphere had some thickness, so that's what I got. Something like that. That's what I was trying to draw there. Okay, so the thickness is easy, it's d rho. That's not going to change, so I want the volume of this thing. The change in phi, well, we have the same problem, same issue. And we need to know how far out we are. So this is going to be rho d phi. 
That is, the length here is going to be the same as the length here on the same sphere. So this, this height is going to be rho <coughs> d phi. You might think initially that this width is going to be rho d theta, but it won't be. So the width is, well, I will certainly have a rho d theta, but it's not really rho, because I have to project it down to the plane. And when I project down to the plane to know how theta changes, I'm going to get a factor of sine phi. So it's really rho sine phi. This is the projection down to the plane where theta is polar times, I just lost it. Uh, right, if I project this sector down to the plane, then this length is rho sine phi. And so this length is, is rho sine phi. So that means that my volume element Coordinates. So in spherical coordinates, 
Well, theta goes all the way around. This is theta. So I'm going to do d theta last. And then phi goes from the top to the bottom. Uh, wait a minute. What am I doing wrong? Zero to pi. Zero to pi. Okay. Oh yeah, because it's from the top to the bottom. Right, zero to pi. So phi goes from the top to the bottom. And R goes from the origin out to the edge of the sphere. But I, so, one, that's my function. And I didn't leave enough room, so I'll write it again. So d phi is last, d theta is last, d phi is next. And then my radius rho goes from 0 to r. But then I need the volume factor, which is this rho squared sine phi. What? What's that called? sine phi. I have this. And I need this rho squared sine phi, the stuff, in whatever order I want. And since I wrote them in this order, I guess I write them in this order. Is this OK? Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, if you want to convert this back into a rectangular, uh -huh. would we divide by the Jacobian? Uh, yeah. It'd be rho sine theta, and then we have to switch variables. Yeah. So if you wanted this in rectangular, then this is going to be a triple triple integral of messy stuff. So let me just write mess here. <laughs> right? It's going to be a triple integral of a mess. X goes from, well, anyway, triple integral of a mess of 1 dx dy dz. But these bounds are going to be equal. They're going to involve square roots and stuff. Ultimately, it's like... Is the volume factor the Jacobian, or is the regular row? So, I didn't talk about Jacobian yet. Oh, this yeah. is the Jacobian. Oh, that's cool. okay. that's All right, cool. so, you know the word Jacobian, that's the Jacobian. Okay. Change the okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm imagining that I have a function that I'm going to add up over these little sphere, sphere cubes. I'm going to chop up my sphere into little cubes that aren't really cubical. They're, they're I don't know, they're sectors cross sectors. The one is the value of the function on the thing. It doesn't matter. So you can think of this as, another way to say that, is that the volume of the sphere is the same as the mass of the sphere if the sphere is of density one. So you can imagine that I'm calculating the mass of this sphere, but the sphere is uniform, it's made of a, something with a uniform density, and the density is 1. So, so then the volume is the mass, or the same. Hmm? Is that the volume? No. F is the thing that I'm integrating over the volume. So if I were to draw a picture of this, I would need to draw it in four dimensions. Yeah. Where I have three dimensions is a sphere, and my fourth dimension is one. So just like if I want to calculate, so I'll put this on hold for a second. I want to calculate the area of the circle. I, want to, I mean, I know how to calculate the area of the circle, but I want to calculate the area of the circle. This is the same, so the area same as the volume of a cylinder of height 1. Right? If I take a cylinder of height 1, then the area of the circle and the volume of the cylinder are the same. So here, I could calculate this area by instead adding a dimension and integrating over the circle of 1. V is my volume no, P. P is some point inside this in the sphere. So I'm just saying, think of the sphere, 
consider all the points in the sphere, and at every point, I assign the value 1 to my function. So then when I add them all up, I should get the volume of the sphere. OK, so I don't want to do this messy rectangular one. This one's easier. Right, so if I integrate this guy d rho, then I get rho cubed over 3, evaluated from 0 to r, which gives me r cubed over 3. That's the thirds and the four thirds. Sine phi, d phi, d theta. I'm going to actually integrate away the, two, the d theta first so I don't have to keep writing it. So actually, let's do it this way. Since theta and phi don't depend, I can switch the order without a change. And so now if I integrate d theta, I get the integral from pi of 2 pi r cubed over 3 sine phi phi as I go from 0 to pi. Uh, now I need a place to write more, just right here. So that, now I integrate the sine, I get the cosine. Somewhere I see you've lost a factor of 2. I can't hear anything, but somewhere I lost a factor of 2. No, because when you, when you integrate the sine of phi, it's going to become cosine of phi evaluated from Oh, from 0, zero to pi, pi, which is right. 2. I was and thinking 0 to pi is 1. Okay, so then I get 2 pi r cubed over 3 cosine phi evaluated from 0 to pi, which is 2 pi r cubed over 3 minus a minus 2 pi r cubed over 3, which is 4 thirds, not 43, <laughs> 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, probably. Oh, yeah, but I evaluate it. It is minus cosine phi. Cosine of pi is minus 1. Minus minus 1 is plus 1. Minus a plus 1 is still a plus 1. So, yes, it is a cosine. It is a negative here. But it didn't matter because I did the order backwards, too. So two wrongs didn't make a right. OK, so. Magically, we know how to compute the volume of the sphere. Yay, we can pass a trade. Um, so, but, you know, it, okay, there are other ways that we can just keep right should be four thirds pi r cubed, but this is maybe. So, so, this integral is pretty easy in spherical coordinates. Now, if we wanted to change the problem to imagine that, hmm, you know, you're going to make your sphere out of some something that gets lighter as you move out. Then instead of integrating one, we would integrate the the density, you know, the density function. Yeah. Uh, so I'm still not really get we do the theta equal to pi, right? From Wait, from you lost it here? Yeah, from here. Okay, so let's think about in cylindrical coordinates how we describe a sphere. Spherical coordinates. My mouth isn't saying what my brain is thinking. So in spherical coordinates, I want to describe the sphere of radius 2. So, first off, I'm going to fix rho. Rho goes from the origin out to r, or 2, whatever r. It goes out to the edge of the sphere. So that gives me, well, I just have a radius, so I don't have anything. And now, now, if I let phi vary, phi can go from 0 down to pi. So that will give me a semicircle. And now, I'm going to let the semicircle revolve 
do like two parts. Around the whole, the whole spin this semicircle. Yeah, that's two pi. So that'll be two pi. So theta here will change by two pi. Okay. So phi changes from zero to pi, and theta changes from zero to two pi all the way around. Yeah, I got that part. Notice we didn't let phi go from zero to two pi because then I get the circle twice. Yeah. So that's why. That's why my bounds are theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Phi goes from 0 to pi. I started the other way around, but I wanted to get rid of the easy stuff first. So I changed the order going from here to here because it made my life easier. Okay? All right, so, so fun. Uh, I'm not going to get to that. Okay. So now let's, let's look at this in a slightly more general setting. What are we really doing here? I mean, of course, if you want, you can just memorize these things, and now you can do integrals in polar, cylindrical, and spherical. But suppose you have some weird coordinate system, you know, dragonal coordinate system. <laughs> um, so what are we really doing? We're describing a change of variables. So just like when you make the substitution u, x in terms of u, when you make a u substitution, you have to describe how u changes when I change x a little bit. Right? So in one variable, let's again think back to one variable. In some sense, there's nothing new in this class for quite a while. Um, so when I make the substitution, when I transform f of x to some g of u, then I say how x, how a little change in x goes. Uh, I have to relate du to dx. Right? So this will be f prime of oh, stop it. Um, so I need to adjust by the derivative, right? Which tells me how u changes in terms of how x changes. And then I make my substitution, right? So I need to do the same sort of thing here where I'm thinking of, let me draw it in three dimensions, but it doesn't really matter how many dimensions I have. This is my one volume object, and then I have some transformation, which is my change of coordinates that gives me my new shape here. I start with my x, y, z, and then my change of variables gives me u, v, w. And on a sufficiently small scale, assuming that my change of coordinates is nice function, then this is going to transform by the derivative dt. So if I write my change of variables, and I calculate the derivative. Well, it's not really the derivative, it's the determinant of the derivative. If I calculate the determinant of the derivative, then that will tell me how my little cube form transforms to some other thing. This thing is called the Jacobian. Yeah? The, uh and it actually gives you a formula to go from. So, so what I want to do now, check that, for example, if I compute the determinant in spherical coordinates, let's start with polar, I get rho squared sine theta as the determinant of that change of variables. Let's, let's do either polar or cylindrical, they're sort of the same. Let's do cylindrical. It's right there on the board. So this is my change of variables rectangular to cylindrical. And I want to check, this is 
my change of variable, let's call it t, for transformation. And I want to calculate dt, which will be a 3 by 3 matrix, but a fairly easy one. So dt will be my matrix of partials. So I take r cosine theta, I have three variables, and I take the derivative with respect to r, theta, and z. So the derivative of r cosine theta with respect to, okay, what am I doing wrong? Uh, cosine theta, and um, now I take the derivative with respect to theta, and I get minus r sine theta. And now with respect to z, I get 0. Do r sine theta, I get sine theta. Derivative of sine theta is r cosine theta. Derivative with respect to z is 0. Derivative of z with respect to r is 0. Derivative of z with respect to theta is 0. Derivative of z with respect to um, z is 1. So this is my derivative matrix of this function t, which takes x, y, z, into r cosine theta, blah, blah. OK. Now I want to compute its determinant. So the Jacobian, which is the determinant of dt. And rather than, well, I guess I could expand it this way. Let me expand it this way instead. So I'm going to expand again about maybe this row. Right, so it'll be plus minus the plus here. So I get 0 from expanding, from taking the determinant of this part, 0 times this, plus 0 times this, plus 1 times the determinant of this matrix. Let me write it out. which is, well, the determinant of this is this times this, minus this times this. Somewhere I lost no, it, is r cosine squared theta plus r sine squared theta. Back to the r out. That's 1, so it's r. So this gives me my r dr d theta is the term. So my Jacobian, my Jacobian to cylindrical R. So the thing that I integrate by, my volume form is R d R d theta. Right, so if I have, again, if I'm integrating by little dragons that tile space, if I have something that tells me how to transform Q into a dragon, if I have a transformation from a cube into a dragon, then the derivative of that transformation, take the determinant, will give me the, the way I need to change my variables to describe something in dragon coordinates. Yeah? Uh, I don't completely get where the determinant is coming from. OK. So what is the determinant? What does this mean? What does this dt mean? This means at a, on a very small scale, if I move theta a little bit, and I move r some other little bit, and I move z, well, some little bit, it doesn't matter how I move z, then how much does the function change? The change of variables function. So if I describe a little change over a cube where I move r, z, and theta, how does 
the volume of my cylindrical cube change? Well, it changes by this. This is a linear transformation. And the, and the determinant measures the total change in volume of this linear transformation. So, for example, if my, if I'm just doing multiplying by 2 in every direction, then my determinant matrix is 2, 2, 2. And so if I'm doing x, y, z goes to 2x, 2y, 2z, then this is my derivative matrix. And if I increase x a little bit, z a little bit, y a little bit, everything changes by a factor of 8. My volumes will blow up by a factor of 8. Here it's more complicated, but the, the determinant measures how much my volumes change as I move around. Infinitesimal. Okay? Alright. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, sure. You can do it the other direction, right? You can get one over square root of x squared. Yeah, if you want. It would be much more complicated. It's more complicated, but yes. You can also just calculate this and then take the inverse transformation. Right? If we know how x, y, and z, I mean, so, so okay. Suppose I want to change now from polar to rectangle. I can write down the transformation. So I was going to do so it's, yeah, the other one. Well, if you want to do that. No, 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 no. Let me, let me continue in this vein because I think it may be reasonable. Suppose I want to go the other way. R theta z goes to. So what is this? Well, if I know z, it goes to z. That's easy. If I know theta, it's uh, the arc tangent of y, y, y over x. And r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's my change of variables going the other way. Okay. Writing the derivative of this is not fun. I mean, it's doable, sure. But there's square roots, there's arc tans. But if you do it, you'll get a matrix, you take its determinant, okie dokie, we're good. But, but dt is a linear map. So as long as the determinant is not zero, that is, we're away from the origin, I can take its inverse. Well, I want. So I want, so let's call this transformation S, not this, okay. Let's call this S and this T, because we already have T on the board. So S is the transformation from cylindrical to rectangular. So the determinant of DS, well S is the inverse of T as long as the function is invertible. So that means that this is 1 over the determinant of dt, right? Because this is a matrix. Its inverse is the inverse matrix. So let's write it in one more step. This is the determinant of ds inverse uh, dt, because s is t inverse. But the derivative of the inverse matrix is the inverse of the derivative matrix, so this is just going to be 1 over the determinant of dt, which is 1 over r. But I want it in x, y, and z, so that's 1 over square root x squared plus y squared. So this is an easier calculation. If you want to do this long calculation, you should get this answer. So it might be easier to look at the inverse transformation and figure out how it relates to the forward transformation. So the Jacobian of this transformation from rectangular, from cylindrical to rectangular, is going to be this. That's not an 11, it's a Okay? All right, I have two minutes. Um, yeah. So if you do the calculation, 
for the spherical one. Let me not do the calculation for the spherical one. You will get a big matrix with lots of cosines and sines. When you start calculating everything out, you use the Pythagorean theorem a couple of times, and blah, 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 and then out falls rho squared sine theta. The calculation looks like this. So let's read it. There you go. Okay. I guess I, I said, let me write in one minute the general theorem. So, uh, so in general, suppose I have some function t taking some domain, which is in Rn. I'll call it Un. So Rn, so I have some, some change of variables here, and it needs to be continuously differentiable, and the boundary needs to be smooth pieces. So the edge of u, the boundary of u, needs to be smooth bits. And it needs to land in, so I want my area, r is the boundary of r is, in, is inside the domain, the interior of the domain t. In other words, Everything's nice in the region where I'm looking. Then, if t is 1 to 1, not 1 to e, 1 to 1 on the region that I'm integrating, that's one thing I need. And another thing I need is that the determinant of dt is not 0 on the region of interest, or I guess T of R, actually. Uh, then, provided F is all nice, then if I integrate F of, let's call it X vector, over the region R, let's call it DB, then this is going to be, I just need to adjust by uh, the region R in the new coordinates, and I'll do F in the new coordinates, and I adjust by the Jacobian, the determinant of T prime. So this is generally what I just said. This is the DU that you need in one variable. It's just the determinant of the derivative of the substitution. You get to do some of these in the homework. Uh, I was going to do an example, but I clearly don't have time for it. Maybe I'll do an example at the start of the next slide.